As the title suggests, we are going to use this series as an opportunity to boldly analyse conceptually rich music in ways no channel is currently doing. No joke, this might be one of the most detailed Death Grips videos ever made. To kick off, I am beginning with one of the most exciting musical groups to emerge in the past decade, Death Grips. Now, if you click this video, you probably know the story by now, but just in case you don't, here's some background. Death Grips is an experimental hip-hop trio formed in 2010 in Sacramento, California, which consists of drummer-slash-producer Zach Hill, mysterious studio wizard Andy Morin, and vocalist-slash-lyricist Stephen Burnett. Zach and Andy had been working together for a couple of years already by that point, and Stefan was a local rapper and visual artist who was previously in the group Fire with his brother. In 2011, the group released their debut full-length project, their sample-heavy mission statement, Ex Military, adorned by a culturally weighted photograph of an Aboriginal person from an old book. Ex Military is a thoughtfully curated, yet simultaneously off-the-cuff, raucous mixtape. For this video, I will be analysing the samples, lyrics, narratives and other ephemeral components of this mixtape to begin the process of synthesizing an all-encompassing theory of death grips, upon which I will build as I traverse through their next several projects in subsequent videos. Now, without further ado, let's begin. I want to start by getting sort of a bird's eye view before we begin our descent. Generally speaking, what is X Military? What makes it unique as a debut? Now, released on April 25th, 2011, X Military is a brutal, often ugly display of debauchery, crime, and insularity. There are 13 tracks, two of which are instrumental interludes. It fits pretty firmly within the subgenre of industrial hip hop. Check out the video on More Mother to get more of a background on that. As it was released for free as a mixtape, it contains numerous unlicensed samples of classic rock, punk, and hip hop songs. Drums appear as both sequenced machines and via the infamous live drum stylings of Zach Hill, who had previously spent a decade in the uncompromising noise rock band Hella. The foremost feature of the project, however, is Stefan Burnett's performance as the main vocalist. He's a rapper, sure, but he's also way more than that. Initially credited only as Ride, Burnett doesn't spit bars so much as he barks venom, emitting a chaotic energy that frequently has been compared to that of the homeless guy that yells at you at the bus stop. To the unsuspecting ear, it sounds like a bunch of nonsensical yelling. As we'll soon see though, there is way more to this performance sonically and lyrically than meets the casual listener at first brush. With that said, go ahead, strap on some swimwear as we are about to dive excessively deep. When you press play on X Military, you're greeted by two samples, which is why I will begin this analysis by discussing the samples that are used throughout the mixtape. Track 1 is titled Beware, a pretty appropriate title if you ask me. Musically, it borrows the opening guitar riff from Jane's Addiction's classic Up the Beach, an ominous set of notes that transitions into a bellowing drone. Like many classic hip-hop projects, it also includes a vocal sample, but this one isn't from a classic kung fu film or pre-recorded skit. It's a quote from infamous murderer and cult leader Charles Manson. Manson is a figure whose presence looms heavily not only over this project, but a number of Death Grips' songs and albums, and we will certainly be addressing those references as they come. Here, he sets the tone with one of his many well-known streams of consciousness rants, this one being about individuality, self-determination, and answering to no one. I'm the king man, I run the underworld guy, I decide who does what and where they do it at proclaims the mad fascist in his prisoner's uniform. This fusion of DIY art ethics and lone wolf independence is a massive part of the history of this band and its guiding philosophies, but recontextualizing the grind of being in an experimental band by framing it with the loaded imagery of a Manson sample is the perfect way to introduce this band and what, in my opinion, is what they're all about. There's also a sample of a song called God Is Watching You by dub slash reggae artist Dickie Burton, but I was not able to track down much information about this artist or song, so just feel free to take that title of that song into consideration for the rest of this episode. The next recognisable sample in this mixtape pops up on track 3, Spread Eagle Cross the Block. This song heavily relies on the massively influential 1958 song Rumble by Link Ray and his Rayman. 
This surf rock instrumental has been used in countless films and television shows, including Pulp Fiction and The Sopranos, while also being considered one of a kind inspiration on legendary musicians such as Bob Dylan, Iggy Pop, Jimmy Page, and Mark E. Smith. Death Grips transforms this classic piece of early rock and roll from a nostalgic sounding set of chords and scales to a song which references torture, substance abuse, and cutting oneself off from everyone and everything else. I think it's worth noting that Link Ray was of Native American descent, enhancing the themes of indigeneity and suspicion of invaders that are so excellently captured by the album cover and ensuing tracks. Link Ray would continue his musical career throughout the 60s and 70s, but he called it quits by the time the early 80s rolled around, moving to Denmark where he remained until he sadly passed away in 2005 at the age of 76. Choosing Rumble makes sense in other ways too. So far, we've heard a Jane's Addiction sample hearkening to the alternative rock movement that was building up in America in the late 80s and early 90s, a Charles Manson sample, directly recalling the disruption of the idyllic late 60s in California and now Rumble. Not only is it a forgotten classic remembered mostly by much older rock musicians who were there to hear it when it was released, but its prominent use in pop fiction established a new association, meaning that many younger folks who encountered this mixtape for the first time will hear Spread Eagle Cross the Block and be reminded of John Travolta and Uma Thurman's $5 milkshakes. And where do they consume those milkshakes? In a stylized diner that's constructed to look like a snapshot of 50s era pop culture. The two actors look at each other silently. On the jukebox, Link Ray's Rumble. This cyclical recontextualization of pop culture nostalgias is a huge component of the sonics of death grips throughout the canon. Beware showed this by juxtaposing a Jane's Addiction riff from 1988 with a rant from a 60s era cult leader. To further complicate things, the Manson sample originally occurred during an interview in 1989. Additionally, Jane's Addiction were commonly compared to Led Zeppelin in their early stages, a band that was very popular in the 60s and early 70s. Moreover, getting back to Spread Eagle, that track includes samples from not only Rumble but also two songs from the Beastie Boys' 1986's debut album License to Ill, those tracks being Fight for Your Right to Party and Girls. All over this mixtape, we will see frequent fusions of what is considered classic or part of the status quo and what's considered alternative, contemporary or cutting edge. This is only the beginning. Not all of the samples on X Military are extremely prominent. The next two tracks, Lord of the Game and Tachyon, Deathion, feature a handful of slightly hidden or more conservatively sourced samples. The former includes more Beastie Boys with a short snippet from Brass Monkey, also from License to Ill, as well as the first instance of the group using the Ditty, a drum warm-up frequently performed by the Blue Devils Drum and Bugle Corps, the current drum corps' international title holders from Northern California. This sample will appear again in another Death Grips project. I also can't forget to mention the classic I Am The God Of Hellfire quote from the group pulled up from the crazy world of Arthur Brown's late 60s psych rock classic Fire. Tachyon uses two minimal samples, a snippet from Bad Brains' hardcore anthem Super Touch and a vocal line from Kati Ranks' A Who Say Me Done. Again, this sort of feels random, right? In just a handful of songs, we're being treated to references to forgotten classic rock icons like Arthur Brown and Link Ray, and the more recognizable work of an impressive crop of alternative rock and hip hop acts from the 1980s, Jane's Addiction, Beastie Boys, Bad Brains, etc. The cutthroat instrumental continues this trend, but twists it. Vocal snippets of two live crew's 1988 song, Move Something, from the album of the same name, are inter spursed with a Death Grip sample? You heard me right. Death Grips is a group that isn't afraid to sample its own work in new songs, and this is something that the group does to this very day. Sampled in Cutthroat is something Ride says in one of the group's earlier non-album singles, which happens to be titled Death Grips, Next Grips. That sample where Ride screams it's death is something the band will sample repeatedly throughout their discography, and we'll be sure to keep track of which songs feature it. It's becoming something like a calling card or an ad lib that they occasionally throw into a song just to inject a little extra hype into it. The next track, Clink, is one of the most interesting in my opinion. It's one of the least cryptic of the band's songs, laying down a very clear concept from even the song title. If you're moderately familiar with prison slang, that's what clink means. If you didn't know, it refers to prison. Well, 
We'll get to the lyrics later, of course, but it should at least be mentioned that the song deals with police brutality and the ways in which African Americans, especially, are disproportionately more likely to experience violence at the hands of the police. The instrumental samples heavily from the classic Black Flag song Rise Above, another 80s hardcore punk song to add to the list. It's a fascinating choice, as Rise Above is more a song about disdainful critics and haters in general than it is about, say, the state. What Death Grips does here is transform the meaning of the original song in a more focused, personal context. The song ends with a sample of a song by the forgotten 60s garage rock band The Castaways. That song is titled Liar Liar, making it extremely clear where this band stands on the police. And once again, we see the juxtaposition of lesser known yet formative rock bands from the 50s and 60s with the alternative hardcore punk and hip hop scenes which were burgeoning throughout the 80s. It's all intentional. Culture Shock is the next track, and its only real notable samples is of David Bowie's The Superman, the final track from his 1970 album The Man Who Sold the World. The line sampled so softly a super god dies. As excessively deep as the series is going to delve, we won't suggest that Death Grips actually predicted Bowie's death five years before it happened. It just seemed like an interesting connection, and it's not the last connection between Bowie and Death Grips, which we'll get to in a few episodes. Speaking of weird pop music from the UK, the 5D instrumental samples Pet Shop Boys' unforgettable hit West End Girls, a song which recalls suicidal ideation, class divide in mid-80s London, and even a reference to Vladimir Lenin returning to Russia from exile to help execute the October Revolution of 1917. Remember, these samples are not just chosen because they sound cool and the members of the band like these songs. There's a reason for all of this. Following 5D is the animated rambunctious Through the Walls, which relies more on Zach Hill's insane drum performance than it does samples, though there are two. First is a clip from that cheesy old viral video called Mental Health Hotline. This one has always stuck with me personally, as the clip sample used to be my mum's personal voicemail message for a very long time. There's also a line pulled from the 2002 aerial Pink song, Getting High in the Morning, the most recent alternative song to be sampled on the tape so far. After this comes Known For It, which relies on some passages from the mysterious French progressive rock group Magma's 1976 song De Futura. I find it interesting that while most of the 80s and 90s samples used on the mixtape are quite recognisable to your average music fan, the ones that are pulled from earlier decades are all by much less well-known artists. Or they present less well-known songs by more well-known artists, as we saw with the Bowie sample on Culture Shock, and which we will see again on the next song. I want it, I need it, Death Heated, the penultimate song is the longest on X Military. Lyrically, it's an indulgent binge, and the fact that it samples two songs from Pink Floyd's first album makes complete sense. Whereas Pink Floyd's most notable work was released in the 1970s and features vocals primarily from David Gilmour, the group had a different vocalist and creative leader on their bizarre first couple of records, Sid Barrett. One of rock music's most tragic figures, Barrett contributed heavily to Pink Floyd's 1967 debut album The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, before finding himself increasingly lost in a shroud of mental illnesses, which were likely not properly diagnosed at the time. Barrett left the band in 68 and left the music industry entirely in 72, living the rest of his life in complete privacy before passing away in 2006. Sort of like Link Ray's life story but much sadder. The two Floyd songs sampled are Astronomy Divine and Interstellar Overdrive, and both are used quite prominently. And if you can believe it, that covers our discussion of the samples used throughout Ex Military. Again, given that it's a free mixtape, the group had way more free reign over which uncleared and unclearable samples they could use. So this discussion won't be nearly this long in future episodes, but hey, it's excessively deep dives. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't painstakingly mention each sample on this project and how they relate to each other and the band. The way Death Grips uses samples on X Military is nothing short of genius, pulling from a good 50 years of pop, rock, hip hop and punk music to tell a story through the sonics that enhance the story told by the lyrics. And hey, speaking of lyrics, as you will undoubtedly notice when you listen to the music presented here, the lyrical themes run the gamut of some of the darkest and most frightening components of modern American society. The lyric sheet contains no shortage of references to crime, drugs, murder, erratic behaviour, paranoia and the occult. We already talked about how the record opens up sonically, but I would be doing Death Grips a massive disservice to not hone in on the lyricism. Now that we've briefly come up for air, it's time to continue our descent. 
Beware is one of the most lyrically poignant and brilliant tracks in the entire Death Grips discography, making it all the more impressive that it opens up their debut full-length mixtape. Previously, I focused on how the dual samples of Charles Manson and Jane's Addiction reinforce each other temporally and philosophically. Now, we're going to tie that into the lyrical content. If Manson's difficult to decipher quote at the beginning captures a maniacal individualism, that vibe is doubled down upon by Burnett's occult inspired lyricism. How could you not be blown away by the opening quatrain that makes up the song's chorus? I close my eyes and seize it. I clench my fists and beat it. I light my torch and burn it. I'm the beast I worship. Wow. Right off the bat, not only do we have the irony of the double entendre in the very first line, seize versus seize, but we also have an ode to individuality and originality that completely undoes the common conception of what so-called Satanists believe. While the pearl clutches and typicals of the world would have you believe that Satanists worship the Dark Lord in the same way a devout Christian would worship Yahweh, Bernat declares himself to the beast that he worships, using the imagery of black magic to conjure a message of anti-authoritarianism. And those are the first four lines. Another thing that I love about Burnett's lyrical methods that make themselves clear on this track is the way he switches words around to make them fit his rhyme schemes and syllable allowances without defeating the meaning of the phrase. For example, the refrain that appears twice in the track, and I know soon come my time, for in mine void a pale horse burns, but I fear not the time I've taken, past the point of no return. His syntax falls somewhere between Jamaican reggae singers and non-native English speakers translating their language literally. It's a unique way of finding new twists on the English language, and while it's a pretty minor thing to point out, it's that sort of wordplay that strikes me as exactly what hip-hop lyricism should be about. Beware reads like a spell from an old dusty tome, something that when read aloud conjures up all manner of vile demons. Simultaneously, it's a complete refutation of that sort of passé style of religious or spiritual deification of an external force. See, this incredible series of lines in the second verse. Worship is not on bended knee. Nature knows not of mercy. To pray is to accept defeat. This song is not in praise of the Satan that Christians love to hate. It's in praise of the almighty individual, the only entity of which any amount of force can truly be ascertained. The powers that be need not worry about the goat sacrifice and the undead army. Rather, they need to worry about an army of individuals who decide to take matters of rebalancing the world into their own hands. So that's track one. Yeah, we're going to be here a little while. Up next is a song which I haven't yet mentioned as it doesn't seem to contain any samples. That would be the classic Guillotine, a song that remains one of the group's most popular. The repetitive hook, which consists of Burnett repeating the phrase, it goes, it goes, it goes, yeah, is also cribbed from a Manson quote, carrying the references through the project Beyond Beware. While Guillotine is totally about using the titular devices to take enemies, haters, evil jurors, and abusers out of the picture, it's also replete with some straight up flexing, the likes of which few rappers are capable of. Consider the opening set of lines. Burnett hits us with the following. Sit in the dark and ponder how. I'm too fit to make the bottom fall through the floor and they all fall down. Out of the shadows, barrage of witch tongue. Cobra spit over apocalyptic cult killer cauldron smoke. Stomp music seriously. The first three lines sound like they might be from the perspective of someone whose job involves murdering criminals on behalf of the state, wondering why they have such power and whether it's moral to wield it, before ultimately deciding not to challenge that quandary. They all fall down after all. A deeper interpretation paints these few lines as a general diss to all the whack rappers making criminally boring or downright disgusting music. They need to watch out because Death Grips is coming to bring absolute slaughter and incredible skill to the rap game. And the lines about witch tongue cobra sprit, that set of lines is actually a well disguised brag about the supernatural powers the band plans on channeling. The barrage of witch tongue cobra spit can be thought of as a metaphor for Burnett himself, a caustic onslaught of deeply layered rhymes, hard fought and cryptically portrayed. The apocalyptic cult killer cauldron smoke is the musical element of the band, making perhaps yet another reference to Manson. Do you know many other apocalyptic cult killers? And occult imagery. The witch's brew is bubbling, the cauldron is smoking, and the result is death grips. Whereas the ethos of individuality and the spirit of competition are frequently occurring lyrical tropes in hip-hop, Burnett manages to find new ways of conveying these messages that aren't immediately clear. 
the line hidden art between and beneath every fragmented figure of speech is an apt analysis from within the song itself, in addition to being a well-deserved brag. Spread Eagle Cross the Block continues to venture out further than many rappers will go when it comes to the topic of drug use, but as you'll soon find out, it's not just about drugs. In many ways, this song is also about music itself and its soothing yet addictive qualities. I love the way this song depicts the aching, pernicious need that accompanies serious drug addiction without losing the fact that the drug being referred to mainly is music. The first verse opens up with the fairly innocuous line, want a beer, have no fear, which is also a potential reference to hardcore punk legends Fear and their song Have a Beer with Fear. But by the end of the first verse, he's already bored to the point of shooting up the drug to get a more intense fix, needing something that will feel him more destroyed and even resorting to stealing that substance and hoarding as much of it to himself that he can. It's a rapid journey, to say the least. Rather than succumbing to his addiction, Burnett uses it for strength. In the second verse, he brags about knowing the supplier of his favourite substance and being the only person on the planet with the ability to access it. In the third verse, he's invincible, skipping past people who are waiting in line, pretending to not hear their objections, alongside his dark, singular lyrical voice. The fourth verse returns to the idea of music or a drug as a vice. The final verse reverts to the laid-back vibe of the first verse's first line, lambasting egoistical rappers who are beholden to industry execs that don't even own their own product. Need no ego to rock. What we know just gets dropped, he says, closing out yet another symbolically rich and demented rap rock song. The next track is Lord of the Game, and it's at this point that I'd like to address a theory that has circulated for a while among Death Grips fans when it comes to X Military as a whole. People have taken the violent imagery and mixtape title to believe that this is actually a covert concept album about a retired Vietnam War veteran having drug fueled flashbacks after returning home broken. While there is plentiful evidence to support this, particularly in the track we're about to discuss, I've not seen any confirmation that this is the case from anyone in the band. That's normal, given that the band hasn't actually given a proper interview in nearly a decade. But aside from the prevalence of the 60s and 70s era rock music and occasional references to war and violence, I don't fully back the theory that this is specifically about what many people believe it to be about. That's not to say I don't think this is a loose concept album, and in fact I think the entire Death Grips discography has been macro conceptual. But I think that the loose references which may suggest the Vietnam War are used to refer the listener back to a contemporary mindset. While the band has rarely spoken about their music, Burnett remarks in his 2012 interview with Pitchfork that he is largely unimpressed by human achievement and that they're more interested in what's happening now than what happened before. The other line in the song that is very rich with meaning is the chorus. When they tell you you must make it and you think hell no, got a bad feeling and can't shake it, hits so low, it's not clear who they is and different fans have different theories. While something is a general dig at authority or the state, I still find myself thinking of the sorts of artists Death Grips loves to mock, slaves to the industry, forced to release a weak product in service of the profits of someone who's never picked up an instrument in their life. It's demoralizing being an artist in that position, constantly worrying about the day your album is shelved indefinitely, or a change of leadership results in you being dropped from the label without any warning, or there being so many untalented, greedy hands in your pot. This isn't of concern for Death Grips, who maintain lordship status completely outside the realm of traditional corporate entertainment superstructures. They're the lords of the game, ruling from outside the box, while all your favourite rappers are stuck inside, trying to appease profit-hungry corporates. The final verse of Lord of the Game touches on those feelings of paranoia and having your passion for music killed by the corporation that's supposedly allowing you to have that career in the first place. Burnett has absolutely no time for such foolishness. Tachyon Deathion follows, promising to build on the momentum from the previous four tracks in what is probably the most animated vocal performance on the entire project. The band's lyrical and musical knack for radical independence and being several cuts above the competition is channeled in this track, which is named after a hypothetical particle that could theoretically travel at a faster rate than the speed of light. In the grand trajectory of this mixtape's particular concept, I like to think of Tachyon as the culmination of the band's statements heretofore on the power of music, culture and nostalgia. Repeatedly, ideas and concepts that are unrelated to drug use in a vacuum are turned into metaphors for drugs, and that is definitely the case here. The band wants to channel the power of the Tachyon to wreak havoc on the concept of art as a product. 
and the idea of employing imagery associated with heavy drug use to communicate that is both refreshing and familiar. In Tachyon, the consumer is meant to imbibe the music of death grips, the same way that they would take a drug with similar side effects. This is exemplified in lines such as, because even if you did, I bet you'd keep coming back, back for more, need it man, you're addicted to the heat, we make beats catch. A lot of those who suffer from drug addictions are most likely not fully aware of the exact science behind why their mind and body craves that drug so much, especially after repeated use. All the addicts know is that they need their fix and they need it quickly. I like that this set of lines also makes it clear that even if you're doing an excessively deep dive into their music, you will never fully understand the band's purpose. And even if you did, you would still feel the need to consume it, unable to stop listening. The first leg of this album, represented by the opening five tracks, represents an overarching tonal setup for not only the rest of X Military, but the rest of the band's career. Right off the bat, Death Grips positions itself as a band of contradicting avant-gardists who value both radical individualism and a grander musical community. The band is able to harness the power of its musical, philosophical, ethical and aesthetic influences into uncharted territories, hitting the unsuspecting listener with such a high magnitude of unique energy that there is no room for a neutral reaction. And even today, for every positive comment you're likely to see about the band online, a negative one exists elsewhere. Not that the negativity matters much to the band. As Burnett states near the end of Tachyon, here's the deal, if you don't feel ill, don't want it nowhere near my zone. Note the double entendre of the word ill, a word that serves as a relic for its status as a slang term in the 80s and 90s meaning cool or great, while also referencing back to the Beastie Boys, whose classic albums include License to Ill and Ill Communication. And of course, feeling ill might not only be a side effect of the whiplash of experiencing the band's music for the first time, but it's also commonly associated with taking too many drugs or drinking too much. Death Grips isn't interested in what you have to say if you aren't either someone for whom they already have respect for as an artist or a zealous fan, ravenously consuming their work to the point where if the band was a drug, then sick feelings would certainly ensue. And even then, the band's respect for its biggest admirers will visibly wane as we move on to the other projects, but more on that in a future episode. After the cutthroat instrumental which breaks up the flow of the album nicely, the band pivots from a mission statement of artistic ethics to one of social ethics. As I stated earlier, Clink is a song that directly confronts police brutality and the American criminal justice system's effects on the psyche of the African American community. Lyrically, like I said before, this is not only the most straightforward song on the project, but probably Death Grips' most straightforward song in general. There's very little symbolism and even wordplay here. The message is clearly a classic anti-police banger in the tradition of NWA songs. Tracks by both parties are on the nose and rely on personal anecdotes and experiences with the police from which to draw their conclusions. I think that Clink not only serves this purpose but also serves the grander purpose of being representative of the band's complete disdain and lack of trust in the American state and its systems of control. Now, Burnett lays it out all plainly. Whether they're hiding behind trees to catch up unsuspecting drivers in speed traps, pinning crimes falsely on suspects before they've even been arrested, or targeting people of colour, the American police constantly make the case for its own disbandment, albeit inadvertently. Put this in context for a second, this mixtape came out in 2011, one year prior to the death of Trayvon Martin, three years prior to the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, and nine years prior to the deaths of George Floyd, Manny Ellis and Breonna Taylor. Now, while police brutality has been something anti-racist movements have fought against for over a century, it's only very recently that they've started to see more discourse as increased technological availability provides the advent of irrefutable evidence of this brutality and its brazenness. In the age of Black Lives Matter, Death Grips was ahead of the curve. Surprisingly, the song doesn't even explore a literal death as the possible end result of an encounter with the police. Burnett's attitude is actually one of annoyance at the hassle of dealing with police on a frequent basis in the Sacramento area, and the outcome he spends the most time exploring is doing hard time in prison. The clink. On a somewhat lighter note, before we move on to the next song, I also love the line by robbing me of my dignity, so in the end I never say much. But ain't a time pass, I don't wish I could flash on Penelope. This refers to a 2006 children's movie about a girl with a pig's nose. Damn. 
The next track is Culture Shock, which like Clink has a fairly straightforward premise that hinges more on social commentary than on the band's musical achievement and goals. The clear explanation for this song is that it presents Bennett's views on contemporary technology and what its proliferation means for humanity as a whole. This goes way beyond the boomer mentality that superficially claims that television rots your brain or that smartphones are making us stupid. In fact, I think that the career moves that will soon follow point to the band making an argument that the internet should be a tool for radical art, activism and community making rather than a way for it to be easier for massive corporations to advertise to us. Culture Shock, however, gives us the worst case scenario. Multiple generations of people constantly being advertised to, lied to, spied on and all the other offences attributable to the mass privatisation and monopolies present online. It also increases people's self-confidence that they are correct about outlandish and absurd claims which they back up by simply linking to something someone else said online. In reality though, much of the information we consume is truly useless or worse, it's propaganda that's meant to engender a favourable view of capitalism and imperialism instead of preference for research and inquisitiveness. In a world where people's thoughts about the internet as a concept range from obstinately regressive to overwhelmingly naive, I think what Death Grips is saying on Culture Shock is extremely nuanced. The internet's negative effects aren't simply a result of what it means to be stripped of context. As a publicly funded project, the internet should be seen as a utility that allows people to connect and organise globally. Its revolutionary potential is immense. However, as it exists for most, the internet is a toxic waste dump of advertisements, unnecessary information, political propaganda in service of the status quo, and trolls. Dear God, the trolls. In addition to the song's titular concept, which is what happens when you wander into an environment which bears an array of cultural components that are foreign and difficult to understand, the refrain repeats the phrase future shock, a term created in the early 70s to refer to the sensation of not being able to keep up with technological advancements. I imagine this is what many people who are older than Generation Xers or even Millennials have been feeling much of these past couple decades, so bogged down in the constancy of change that they simply aren't able to maintain a level head. And all of this digital noise makes it easy to be distracted, even when you're able to cut through the noise to try and focus on what matters, it's still very difficult to know if what you're being told about what matters is even true theories about the corporate media's ability to invent reality and manufacture consent to imperial activities have been around for decades. At the time, and at times, it feels like you need to ascend beyond the status of mere mortal in order to even comprehend it all. And I think that's where the slightly confusing, you need to vibrate higher refrain factors in. In order to grasp the world we live in fully without succumbing to existential dread, we would need to exist at a higher speed than we currently do. A full rewiring of the brain, an increased rate of micro vibrations throughout the body that allow us to ascend past the realm of comprehensible three dimensions we know and love and into the fourth and fifth dimensional worlds, wherever those may be. Culture Shock is a song about futility, being bogged down by the toxicity of the digital world, and tacitly how Death Grips manages to rise above all that, cut through the nonsense, and deliver a multitude of powerful statements. So we've had the introductory missive of the first handful of tracks followed by some potent social commentary on this second batch. The third leg of the mixtape is where those grounded and tangible approaches turn into full-blown chaos. Through the Wolves is where Burnett's in-album persona of Ride begins to face obstacles beyond his prior comprehension, while Clink and Culture Shock are about police brutality and the corporatized internet. Through the Walls is about Burnett starting to come to terms with his inability to circumvent these problems on his own. No lone wolf can tear down entire systems of subjugation and oppression. Why can't I just float through the walls, he asks in a frantic shout. The walls he's talking about almost certainly refer to the aforementioned systems of control, something that no person can merely float through or rise above just on their own. We're all stuck behind these walls and unfortunately many of us don't even realise it. He likens the walls to plutonium law, referring to both the radioactive corrosive substance associated with the atomic bomb and the term describing a long series of stories which make up a larger narrative. In other words, the world we live in is designed to keep us imprisoned by telling us made up stories about history. All this process ends up doing is killing us, some slowly and others quickly. He describes cowards and how they have the gall to try and act like they're not trapped between these walls. Later he says, perhaps sarcastically, how it is now, 
how it always was. The idea of breaking free of the capitalist superstructure sounds just as likely as walking through a wall, a restricted movement in a three-dimensional world. But in a four or five-dimensional world? While Through the Walls represents a frustration with the way things are, known for it presents a potential solution, at least for Ride's character. What can one do in such an oppressive world, where everyone exists at varying degrees of subjectivity to a manipulative state? This song suggests something that I think would have made French existentialists like Sartre and Camus very pleased. Rather than mould himself to the desires of the status quo or try to convince the blissfully ignorant to see the world for what it is, Ride prefers to respond to the callous absurdity of our world by simply doing whatever he wants. Drugs? Sure. Shirking responsibilities that only serve to enrich the greedy? Yes. Killing the enemy? Absolutely. He stresses that these are his decisions to make and that each individual person should be taking more of their own lives into their own hands. Ride just represents an extreme fatigued and mentally broken version of that possibility. Living any other way leaves you feeling used, shortchanged and constantly at risk. Or as he so eloquently puts it, I pay the price to roll with it. Waste your life and you won't get it. Played out with nowhere to go, bet it. Ride lives a criminalized life full of cheap thrills, but he considered this risky life to be a massive preference to living a life colored within the lines drawn for us by the powers that be. What does that risky lifestyle include? I'm so glad you asked. Next up is I Want It, I Need It, Death Heated, the album's longest track. I previously mentioned that this song samples two Pink Floyd tracks, particularly songs from the Barrett era of the band, which was informed by his prolific use of psychedelics. The song takes that association with the psychedelic 60s to levels that would have made even Hunter S. Thompson blush. This track describes an evening of revelry that includes basically every poor decision imaginable, resulting in a cocktail of substances that absolutely no person should ever try. Every hedonistic substance is on the table. Ride's only two concerns in the song are dopamine fueled gratification, as he details through six verses his experience being off his rocker at a party. A quick read through the lyrics shows that this song is just absolutely filthy, with Ride describing the evening's events in grave detail. Is the logical next step from Known For It, a song about following your own path. In the world of ex-military, Ride's path is the constant search for instant gratification in a world of the exact opposite. I would hope that it goes without saying that at this point that I want it, I need it is not an endorsement of the attitudes and behaviours outlined therein. By all accounts, Stephen Burnett is a very level-headed and soft-spoken person, something not at all evidenced by his portrayal of the MC Ride character throughout the Death Grips discography. The over-the-top depictions of mindless consumption are almost certainly meant to serve as a continued commentary on the way in which people are left very few choices in life under capitalism, so the things that they can control will often be done in overabundant excess. Living between the walls is a miserable experience for most and it makes sense logically that people would prefer to spend their free time being overindulgent. I think this song serves more as a warning away from the mindless, hedonistic vibes and it does this by depicting them in an extremely exaggerated fashion. And finally we arrive at the final song, unlucky number 13 in the tracklist, Blood Creepin. We've seen the ride character introduce himself as a loner drug addict who plays by his own rules often finding himself the target of police harassment and brutality. The drug's worst effects take hold in Blood Creeping, a song about Ride and a friend taking matters into their own hands when they notice they're being followed. Whether they're actually being followed is hard to confirm narratively, as we know that drug-induced paranoia and hallucinations are common references throughout the project. It's also not clear if the vehicle following them around is actually being driven by the police, but Ride just assumes that is the case. The first and second verses of the song detail Ride's plan to get in a separate vehicle and trail the offending vehicle while his buddy leads. What he plans to do with these stalkers should be pretty clear. He says it outright. I'll creep up on him from behind and break him off one by one. In the time it takes you to blink your eyes, it'll already be done. After this transpires, the third verse pivots back to the drugs with Ride describing the various pills he's going to be needing for the remaining life ahead of him. He mentions blue ones which is a possible reference to both MDMA and the blue pill from the Matrix, which if you don't remember, is the one you take if you want to stay inside the illusory system with no knowledge of the world beyond. I think it's fitting that the mixtape ends here, without much of a conclusive ending to the narrative that's been concocted. Well, not an obvious one anyway. So we've just gone through both the music and the lyrics of Ex-Military in extraordinary detail. 
As I wrap up this analysis of the project and what it's trying to say, I want to of course add that there are many equally valid interpretations of what this mixtape and this band as a whole is trying to say. These are the musings of a man who's been a fan ever since the band's existence. In fact, I remember a time when this was the only project Death Grips had under their belt, so please understand that I come at this from the perspective of a devoted fan. With that all out of the way, let's put a final stamp on this. So what is X Military? X Military is the ultimate introduction to Death Grips and what the band was trying to say by forming in the first place. It definitely doesn't encompass a full vision of the band's scope, but it does a damn good job of setting up themes that will be explored more on in later projects. Ex Military, the story of a man called Ride. He's like a lot of us, working soul crushing jobs, living paycheck to paycheck, constantly hassled by authority, finding solace only in immediate physical gratification. He comes from a violent upbringing, but deep down he has the capacity for artistic brilliance and building community. He's a rapper, and he carries himself as such, with all the bravado, ego, and, and nonsense talking that one comes to expect with a rap game. His music is original and cutting edge. And he doesn't do it in the hopes that he'll achieve fame or glory. He is David Bowie, Henry Rollins, Link Ray, Arthur Brown, Sid Barrett and HR all rolled into one, but so, so much more at the same time. He is the physical embodiment of what the state wants you to fear as such. A radical, intelligent black man covered in occult inspired tattoos, screaming like an addict in withdrawal, begging the listener to journey with him into the real world, the world for what it is. Ex-military is an indictment of social systems of control, capitalism, imperialism, colonization, the prison industrial complex, privatization and state surveillance. It is a black hole of nostalgia, pulling in pop culture and alternative rock and shredding it to bits only to put it back together again in which we imbue it with new meaning. It deconstructs every hip hop tradition imaginable while also celebrating these genres long and rich history. It's an endorsement of self-creation, self-acceptance, and self-confidence. A manifesto for every person who's sick of having a morality spoon-fed to them by a system that lacks and opposes any comprehensible morality in the first place. It is like a horror film, satirizing the world through exaggerated displays of sex and violence, all in service of that great intangible meaning that will look like different things to different people. To me, and maybe to me alone, ex militaries half warning, half cry for help. Just because you see the world for what it is doesn't mean you're actually going to be able to carry yourself in the sort of manner typical of Ride as depicted throughout the project's lyrics. Burnett describes and depicts Ride as someone who accepts the world as it is and goes about his life, rolling the dice every day he chooses not to abide by society's rules and expectations. But even he recognises that this lifestyle won't produce longevity, even if it boosts his confidence. Seeing the world for what it is can often make someone feel even more helpless. And maybe ex-military is the band's way of extending an arm to those who feel the same way, lost, confused and unaware of where you are or where you're going. The mixtape's 50 minutes of incredible bangers and catchy jams certainly serve as a good enough escapism from the anxieties this world can cause. It feels insular and spiteful, but I choose to see it as an empathetic call to action, and I hope I've managed to convince you that this project can be seen this way too. Death Grips' ex-military is a fascinating project and one of the most fascinating made in music's history. It employs instantly recognisable samples to make connections with the audience based on nostalgic trigger sounds, while also refusing to adhere to a straightforward trajectory in the tradition of those sample sources. It contends with a world that is paradoxically both increasingly interconnected and atomized. It rails angrily against an oppressive world while also critiquing the apathy with which so many readily accept such a world. It is a fiery political and social statement that stands just as strong in autumn 2020 as it did in spring 2011. Now, while today's world is certainly quite different from the world the band was writing about nearly a decade ago, it's not so different that the lyrics and overall message don't hit extremely hard. Next time, we're going to discuss what happened to Death Grips after Ex Military, including their signing to a major label and the deeper meanings hidden within their classic debut studio album, The Money Store. I sincerely thank you for watching this and joining me on this incredibly personal journey of analysis and understanding.